The year was 1862. Abraham Lincoln was in the White House. He was facing a civil war, which actually did start a year after he did this. And he had to find a way to pay for it because he wanted to keep the country together. So he established an office in the government called Commissioner of Internal Revenue. It was a temporary position. It expired automatically after 10 years. So as you can see, we won the war and it was paid for. Further down the line, it was 1913. Woodrow Wilson was in the White House. He was facing a war, a war in Europe called World War I. He needed to pay for it. Fortunately, Congress had just implemented the 16th Amendment to the Constitution. The Congress shall have the power to lay and, I'm sorry, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived. Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> The Bureau of Internal Revenue was established. This was not temporary, it was permanent. And in 1953, it became the Internal Revenue Service. <coughs> the federal government has rules, a lot of them. And they're codified in the Code of Federal Regulations which is thousands of pages. The code is broken down into titles. For instance, Title 11 is federal elections. Title 17, commodities and securities exchanges. Title 22, foreign relations. And then there's my favorite, Title 26, internal revenue also called Treasury Regulations. This is a very large group of regulations. Oh, wow. <laughs> Before you this morning is the Internal Revenue Code. <laughs> oh! Like that? There you go. This is 5,100 pages. Wow. If you read these books, you'd be asleep in about, oh, 10, 15 <laughs> minutes. Most of it would be meaningless to us. I'm in the business and it's meaningless to me. <laughs> so it's interesting to see it, and that's the reason I bought those books, because I want to be able to show you and my clients what the Internal Revenue Code looks like and how big it is and how difficult it is to understand. Now we might refer to these books from time to time, but usually enrolled agents who are US tax court preparers, which means they've achieved a little bit higher level, uh, may use those books when they represent people in tax court, which hopefully doesn't occur too often. But we have other reference material. That would be this little book right here. This is the tax book. You never would have guessed that, would you? And it has 43 chapters. It has 43 chapters because this covers both individual and business returns. So what's the difference? In the Internal Revenue Code, you go to look up uh, a particular subject and you find the citation where it belongs, you go read it, it refers to another citation for more information. So you have to go look that up and read that. And then that one may refer to another citation. So the information in those two books is spread all over the place, which makes it very time consuming to use them as reference material. But this little 43 chapter book, and I know it looks big, but compared to that it's very little, is easy to find because it takes 
things by subject matter, breaks them down into chapters, and then each item is broken down with the requirements and what you need to do to report it. So this is much easier to use, it's much faster, and during tax season, it's all about volume. So you don't want to be sitting around reading books, you want to be doing tax returns. There's a third source, and I hope you won't tell anybody this. It's the internet. If you have a tax question and you go online to your browser and type it in, usually you will, it'll take you to a page that gives you an answer. So there's just two problems. Problem number one, you have to use the right verbiage. So if you get that wrong, you may not end up at the place where you want to be. Problem number two, when I read something about taxes on the internet, I have a pretty good understanding because I have a lot of background. But some of my clients don't have a clue what I'm talking about from time to time. And you can't blame them. Most of them are not tax people. That's why they come to me. So using these books and reading them and trying to figure out what the right thing to do is can be challenging at times. But it's always interesting and it's always fun and it's always great when one of my clients who is absolutely scared to death of the IRS comes to me and I can help them out. And I'm working with a young lady right now. She's a young mother. She's got four children. Her husband is a mechanic and you know, they're just struggling to get by in this economy. And they're having issues with the IRS. And she is really scared. But there's really no need to be scared because these issues happen all the time. Nothing is perfect. You know, you cannot make things perfect with books like those. You have to have somebody who knows what they're doing. So I'm able to reassure her and let her know that she's got somebody that's gonna go through it with her and get her through it. And we will get her through it, because we know what we're doing. And even though the IRS seems like a very bad organization, the individual people who work there are pretty darn nice. So if you ever have occasion to talk to them, thank them for their service, because they take a lot of bull from the public. Mr. Toastmaster. 